4chan has a reputation for being one of the most degenerate sites on the surface web. But around nine years ago, some felt that it just wasn't corrupt enough, and so Masterchan was created, which strived to be a free place for content related to any topic, no matter how depraved. As I'm sure you could predict, it became a hotbed for some of the most disgusting content you can imagine, and this led to the formation of what was known as the 222 Cult, a mysterious and morally bankrupt group of predators who used the site to indulge in their sickest fantasies. Let's investigate. If you enjoy internet mysteries and generally disturbing content, feel free to subscribe and turn on notifications for more content like this. If you're interested in supporting the channel, you can become a Ko-fi member or a channel member to gain access to uncut videos and other perks, or you can leave me a tip by clicking the thanks under this video. Thanks to anyone who considers this. This video centres around topics that some users may find triggering, particularly CP, so viewer discretion is advised. You can become a Kofi member to watch an uncut version of this video which features extra details that were unsuitable for this cut. While freedom of speech on the internet is a contentious topic, with many people believing there is a limit to what should be allowed, some are in favour of totally uncensored spaces where anything goes, no matter how controversial, immoral, or even illegal certain content is. It's undeniable that the internet in general is much more restricted and moderated than it was, say, 20 years ago. Within that time, even websites that were initially founded with free speech as a fundamental principle have become less and less free, with increased moderation and decreased tolerance for content that could be seen as offensive or damaging. Take Reddit for example. When it was founded in 2005, it soon became home to a cesspit of highly controversial yet not quite illegal subreddits like Jailbait, Creepshots, Incels, and Watch People Die. These subreddits were eventually banned, and although some have been replaced with slightly tamer alternatives, you can still watch people die and find various other not safe for life content on the iBletch subreddit for example. Reddit certainly isn't the unconstrained haven it once was. These days, if you want a taste of what Reddit used to be, arguably taken a step further, you might venture onto 4chan, which is much less strict in its moderation and allows users to post anonymously without creating an account. But there are still some restrictions, and moderators are able to delete threads and ban users for extreme violations of the rules. Sometime around 2014, masterchan.org was created as an alternative to sites like 4chan, it strived for total freedom of speech and had identified areas where these sites prevented that, then proposed solutions. Here's an explanation from the so-called Newbie Tutorial page of the now defunct site. Masterchan has reinvented pretty much everything about image boards. The result is a modern chan that is better to use in many aspects, but can be intimidating to a newcomer. Here you'll be taught some key principles behind it to help ease your way into these new features. What makes Masterchan different? Freedom of speech. Moderators and admins cannot ban you nor delete your posts. Full privacy. Your IP address is not stored on the database along with your posts. All proxies and Tor are enabled. Captureless. You don't need to type captures. Board creation. There are official boards, but anyone is free to make their own user-created niche board as well. Your reaction right now must be, but that's no man's land. All boards must be a complete chaos filled with shit posts, illegal content, and automated posting bots at the verge of gaining conscience. It's each man for himself. That would be true on traditional chans, but as already mentioned, Masterchan has reinvented a lot of things to make all that work smoothly. Let's see how it works in practice. Freedom of speech, aka mods can't touch you. If mods cannot delete posts, how do boards remain organised? 
On Master Chan, each board is comprised of both an on-topic and an off-topic area. These sections are independent from each other, so if people make thousands of off-topic threads, none of the on-topic ones expire nor move to later pages. This allows complete freedom of speech, but at the same time boards remain neatly organised, a simple but very effective solution. Mods merely move threads between on-topic and off-topic. On traditional chans, any slightly off-topic thread has to be deleted. On Master Chan, nobody can delete them. Off-topic threads can be fun and even give a community its unique identity and culture, they just need to be properly contained. Privacy and no capture, aka governments and NSA, GTFO, and Google too. On any website on the internet, Facebook, 4chan, Reddit, every single message or post you make is saved on a database along with your IP. This is mostly done for moderation purposes. You need to know someone's IP to prevent that same person from abusing the system again. That means anyone, a government, a hacker, the site's owner or technical staff can peek at the database and know everything you have ever said online. How does that make you feel? Masterchan has two modes of posting. In one, when you post normally as you do on any other chan, your IP is removed of its last two digits, encrypted and only then stored on the database. This gives you the most privacy of any chan out there as your IP is only partially stored. The second mode does not require your IP at all and thus all proxies and Tor are enabled. It is a system called anonymous accounts. They work like some sort of trick code that does not display a name and are the equivalent of a free 4chan pass. Anonymous accounts are like wizards, they start weak, you can't even post images with them but eventually they'll have incredible power. You can create as many anon accounts as you want, and the more you post with them, the more benefits you get over time, such as being able to bypass captures and post images. Spammers are people who post illegal content. Only illegal content is removed at Masterchan and only by the Chan creator. Will quickly have their post deleted and their post count reduced to zero, thus losing all their privileges and becoming unable to repeat their offences, all without their IPs being neither stored nor banned. And the system will remember the last ID you used, so you only need to type it once. Freedom of speech, all proxies enabled, Tor enabled, bypass capture, cookies not required for anonymous accounts, and all with real, complete anonymity. Even people sharing the same house or building, thus having the same IP, can post independently from each other, and journalists or other people who want to divulge information that could put their lives in danger can do so on Masterchan with Tor. I hope this tutorial helped you understand Masterchan better. To any free speech advocates who haven't witnessed the absolute shit show that has arisen on 4chan and even Reddit in the past due to a lack of moderation, Masterchan might seem like a great idea. Sure, you might not like everything you see on there, you might disagree with some users' opinions and even get triggered by some of the content, but that's just part and parcel of freedom of speech on the internet, right? How bad can it get? Pretty bad, it turns out. Unsurprisingly, a site that allows users to post absolutely anything they want with no chance of it being traced back to them is bound to attract the degenerates of society like flies around shit. Masterchan had a rocky run from day one. For one reason or another, it was constantly down. Sometimes this was due to a lack of capacity on the servers or because the small team behind it, which may have even just been the owner themselves for all I know, struggled with the workload of running the site, and inevitably, external forces were working to shut it down from the off. They finally succeeded in 2017, and not only was the site taken down, but archives were removed too, leaving behind only scattered remnants to prove the site even existed, and even less to shed light on the content it featured. A few comments I found online spoke of animal abuse, torture videos, groups of trolls who attempted and even succeeded, according to one claim, in convincing people to take their own lives, cyberstalking that turned into real life harassment, and of course, CP. Lots and lots of CP. 
In fact, the CP was so blatant and uncensored that there were numerous comments on Reddit from users who somehow stumbled across the site, went no further than the front page and worried they were going to get arrested for the things they'd unwillingly seen before panicking and immediately clicking off the site as soon as they realised what it was. If you search Master Chan on Google Images now, alongside a few memes, the results are full of photos of children. Nothing illegal, but this likely provides more hints as to the content of the site. CP technically wasn't allowed on MChan. The owner of the site would apparently remove it when he could, but he couldn't exactly keep an eye on it 24-7, and because so much of it was shared by users who couldn't be identified and banned, there was a constant stream of it daily. For every five posts that were removed, ten more would pop up. It was a never-ending cycle. There's not much credible information at all to explain why M-Chan was taken down, but the story seems to involve an underage girl, I'm not sure how young, named Mara, who a number of users had become infatuated with. It appears she was also known on 4chan, but M-Chan users took this sick obsession to a whole new level. As far as I'm aware, no actual CP was shared of her, but apparently people would share normal photos of her, and some would photoshop CP and edit her face onto it. This is disgusting enough in itself on so many levels, but one user decided that their sick fantasies weren't enough and actually showed up at her school. He uploaded several photos of the outside and then inside of her school in the Netherlands with timestamps, prompting numerous other users to report him. Dutch authorities launched a criminal investigation and it seems that this was the beginning of the end of M-Chan, however this happened in October 2014, presumably only a few months after the site was founded, so it's not entirely clear why it took so long for it to be shut down, or if there were other incidents that ultimately led to its demise. So as we've established, you didn't have to search at all for CP to find it. It would pop up on the front page and in various boards on the site. But there was one M-Chan community in particular that was renowned for being especially inappropriate and downright sickening. 222. This board centred around CP with an added fixation on dead bodies, typically dead children. It was the cesspit of an already vile and unprincipled site. The name 222 comes from a book titled Two is Too Young to Die, and this is where the bizarre rabbit hole really begins. Two is Too Young to Die was written by an individual who called himself J.B. Smeary. This is of course a pseudonym and an anagram of J.B. Ramsey, referring to John Benet Ramsey, a child beauty queen who was murdered at the age of six at Christmas in 1996. It was initially believed that she had been kidnapped as she went missing and her parents found a ransom note in the home. However, hours later, her father found her dead body in the basement. It's a very contentious case with theories ranging from an intruder being responsible to one or more family members killing her, either accidentally or intentionally, and staging the ransom note to deflect suspicion. There is no solid evidence that the family were involved though, and no one else has ever been convicted of the murder. Two is Too Young to Die was apparently once sold on the Barnes & Noble website. There are screenshots of the listing, though given the nature of the book, I'm not sure how it ended up on there. It's not the kind of content that any reputable company would want to be associated with. I managed to find a Google Doc supposedly containing the whole thing, I'm fairly certain it is the actual book, as I'm horrified enough that someone wrote it in the first place. I don't know why anyone would go to the lengths of writing a fake version to replicate it. It's 40 pages long. I got about 12 pages in when I thought, f*** this, I've seen enough, and just skimmed the rest for any relevant information. It's extremely graphic, written almost like a memoir, but addressing the reader at points too. In it, J.B. Smeary describes how his sick fantasies of murdering and abusing children began, though he makes it clear that he doesn't typically enjoy the murder itself, that's just damage control to reduce the risk of him being caught. J.B. goes into detail about John Benet Ramsey and even claims to have been responsible for her murder. She apparently wasn't his only victim. He speaks of a project, 
part one of which is this book, and the scavenger hunt, as he calls it, to prevent the death of the two-year-old girl he claims to have kidnapped. Part two would be Necro Hurtcore, which JB claimed would be, quote, the greatest CP video of all time. Here's a quote from the book explaining the game that will determine whether or not the two-year-old child lives or dies. Acting upon anonymous tips from a concerned citizen in California, a police raid was conducted upon one of the 222 crew's finest foot soldiers upon December 30th, 2014. This led to the seizure of some of our electronic accounts, so forth. To our fallen foot soldier, you, sir, our master race, and a top hat chum all the way. Fortunately, no high-ranking senior officials of our operation were taken into custody, so our work continues. We will have to become even more vigilant as public awareness of 222 increases. At this time, I have in my possession a two-year-old child, female. I will not divulge all the details, obviously, but this is to be my legendary crowning achievement as never before seen or imagined. I've orchestrated this last chapter in my life so that the public can determine the fate of this child's life. The infamous ransom note that was never properly decoded, though the key was clearly given, SBTC. You can't trust bullshit, so this time I will spell it all out in exquisite clarity since the general audience is oblivious to noticing the all too obvious. This child can live if the code is broken. It will reveal her location, where she will be found safe and unharmed, but every game has time limits, and this game is no exception. If she is not discovered before the time is up, I will murder this child in the most atrocious manner and disseminate the video record to be eternalized upon the World Wide Web. This brainchild of mine will be known as Necro Hurtcar. We have a few weeks to play this game, but the clock is now running. Two is too young to die, so maybe this time around one of you wannabe private investigators can figure things out before it's too late. For the child's sake, I hope all you social justice warriors do a better job deciphering the code than you did with John Benet's investigation. At this point, do I believe that JB Smeary murdered John Benet Ramsey, or that he has kidnapped a two year old child who he plans to murder if the public don't win the game? No. Had I stumbled across all this nearly nine years ago when it was happening, I'd still argue it's maybe worth checking out, just on the off chance there was any truth to it. If there's even a chance that a child's life is at stake, it's better to leave no stone unturned, but ultimately I absolutely think he's bullshitting. That said, the detail he went into about what he wants to do to kids, and what he claims to have already done, is so repulsive that I didn't even want to continue reading, let alone repeat any of it here. Sure, people can write fictional books about murder and other atrocities without actually being murderers or bad people at all, it's just creative writing. But when it comes to child abuse and CP, those are not topics that people describe in such detail if it's not something they personally fantasize about. Regarding the scavenger hunt and the John Benet Ramsey murder confession, the book is almost certainly a complete fabrication, but does that mean that JB Smeary isn't a predator and hasn't harmed other children? It seems that the 222 board on MCHAN was almost exclusively centered around CP, and JB Smeary was an active user on there, so whether or not he physically harmed any kids, he almost definitely was a paedophile. Clearly, JB Smeary is a pseudonym, so that leaves us with the question who actually wrote this book? The title of the Google Doc is quote, 222, Two is Too Young to Die, Confession by John Benet Ramsey's Murderer, Robert Adolf Enyart, aka JB Smeary. Bob Enyart was a conservative talk radio host and pastor of Denver Bible Church in Denver, Colorado. After a quick search, I was left a little confused what his connection was to John Benet Ramsey or her murder, as there are no credible sources that even mention the two individuals on the same page, and he was never named an official suspect, or, as far as I can tell, even considered a suspect. 
After digging a little further, I did come across a few YouTube videos with titles claiming that he was the murderer, but the videos contained no evidence or any kind of information suggesting that he was involved. For example, clips of news reports about the case that don't even mention his name. Then I found a website, www.bobenyartmurdered.johnbenetramsey.com, which straight up looks like your typical crazy conspiracy site, full of rambling paragraphs that don't really say anything, let alone provide any actual evidence to back up their claims, complete with a few references to satanic cults. It instantly reminded me of the website that was created to prove, with zero evidence, that Stephen King had killed John Lennon. The site seems to have been created by a Timothy Charles Holmeseth, who I assume also shared the Google Doc that featured the Two Is Too Young To Die book, as this book is referenced on the website alongside the claim that it was written by Bob. Bob was certainly a controversial individual. He was not only against abortion, he advocated for the death penalty for women who had abortions. He was not only homophobic, he would mock gay people who had died from AIDS on his talk show, reading out their obituaries while playing the Queen song Another One Bites the Dust. He also encouraged corporal punishment of children, in fact, he was given a 60-day jail sentence in 1999 after hitting his third wife's seven-year-old child with a belt so violently that he caused significant physical damage to their skin. To summarise, Bob was an absolute POS, but he likely had nothing to do with the murder of John Benet Ramsey. I don't know if Timothy Holmseth and the other individuals involved in spreading that theory were genuinely convinced that Bob was the murderer, or if they intentionally fabricated it out of hatred towards him. Either way, there's no evidence to suggest he was the author of Two Is Too Young To Die. I guess it is possible that Timothy wrote the book himself to frame Bob, but it seems like a lot of effort to go to when there is nothing in the book actually linking Bob to the crime. And again, it would take a really messed up individual to come up with the stuff that's written in it. I find it more plausible that Timothy stumbled across the book and either used it to support his theory that Bob was a murderer, or for some unknown reason, it's that that sparked the theory in the first place. After refusing to get vaccinated against COVID, filing a lawsuit against imposed mask wearing and limits on the size of gatherings at his church, and spreading debunked theories that the vaccines had been tested on aborted fetuses, Bob died from COVID in September 2021 at the age of 62. So we're back at square one and still left with the question of who wrote this book. The main theory that's discussed in the rare references to any of this online is that a YouTuber who goes by the name of Montagraph was either the author of the book or was a prominent member of the 222 cult who features in the book with the name Potion Master. Montagraph has just over 70,000 subscribers and has been uploading videos since June 2010 until the present day. It has been suggested that a couple of his old videos contain references to John Benet Ramsey and her murder. For example, a now deleted video titled The Umbrella Man showed him wearing a mask, taunting a woman who is tied up and gagged. Apparently at the time, some believed this was a genuine snuff film, though of course it wasn't. The video ends with an illustration of a woman lying on the floor, presumably either unconscious or dead, and it has been alleged that this is supposed to represent John Benet. The gipster.blogspot.com draws comparisons between a handwritten note that appears in the video and the ransom note in the John Benet case, though only a few individual letters appear to be a potential match, and the handwriting in both notes in general looks very different. Three months after John Benet's murder, a man named John Kennedy contacted the police alleging that an acquaintance, Michael Helgoth, was the killer. The gipster.blogspot.com claimed that Michael and Montagraph knew each other and that Michael had filmed a video of Montagraph in which he was dressed in women's clothes holding an umbrella. The blog compared this to a photo of John Benet in which she's holding an umbrella. It provides no sources to corroborate the claim that it was Michael behind the camera, or that the two men had anything to do with each other. 
Furthermore, Michael was investigated by the police and no evidence was found of his involvement in John Benet's murder or of any connection at all to the Ramsey family. If you're thinking this is all a massive stretch, you're not the only one. I can only assume that more links between Montagraph and JB Smeary were documented at one point and either I haven't been able to find them or they've been deleted from the internet. If not, I have no idea how his name ever came up in relation to any of this. So, just like with Bob Enyart, we don't have any solid evidence to suggest that Montagraph was the author of the book or that he was the potion master referenced in it. Some people around the time all this happened believe that the book was written and the 222 cult created to frame Montagraph. Unless we are missing a lot of information tying him to any of this, I don't believe this theory to be very plausible either, because every supposed link just seems to be people clutching at straws. There's nothing in the book outright claiming or even suggesting that Montagraph was involved. It seems that others tried to pin the book on Montagraph after, but I don't think framing him was the motive for the book being written in the first place. The story takes an even stranger turn with the final main theory that the book was written by a man named Daniel Marion Mitchell Jr. Daniel was an author, albeit not a very well known one. It seems he only wrote three books and there's next to no credible information about him online. In 2013, a book was found on Barnes & Noble titled Rain Train, Trolley Ruling Fools Into Suicide. It was allegedly written by Tamerlan Saniev, who with his brother was responsible for the bombing at the Boston Marathon in April 2013. A Reddit user around the time described the book after they purchased it. I can only describe the book at my first glance as a story of terrible paranoia and schizophrenia. The book is more like a collection of short stories, journal entries and letters which loosely tell the tale of a few separate people whose lives seem to be intertwined. Some characters have obvious pseudonyms, Jimmy aka James Holmes, Lanzo aka Adam Lanza, although some characters are represented by their actual names. The overarching thing that connects them is level 121, some sort of obscure, satanistic mind control that forces them through hallucinogenic acts to commit terrible acts of violence or pain upon others. The book can be found on Wayback Machine and I only flicked through without reading the whole thing. My tolerance for messed up literature reached its peak after just a few pages of Two is Too Young to Die, so forgive me for not delving deeper. Anyway, this book contained a series of letters that were allegedly written by Daniel Marion Mitchell Jr. that were apparently obtained by hacking emails. One of Daniel's books, published in 2011, was titled The Lords of 2112, the poignantly vulgar and vulgarly poignant chronicle of America's future. Tamerlan's book states that the Lords of 2112 was influenced by Adam Lanza, who murdered 26 children and adults in the Sandy Hook school shooting. In fact, it implies that the Lords of 2112 had been written with the sole purpose of programming Adam to commit the crime. Both these books apparently contain coded messages, and while there are various theories, some quite frankly sound ridiculous, I haven't come across any plausible suggestions of what these hidden messages are, or if they even exist. This is an entire rabbit hole in itself, but this video would be hours long if I went into much more detail on it, so let's get back to the focus of this video. What does any of this have to do with the 222 cult, or the 2 is too young to die book? Considering all these books supposedly have hidden messages and codes, one minor link could be the names. As for the title, The Lords of 2112, 1 plus 1 equals 2, so you could read it as 222. It's a stretch for sure, but so are most of these wild theories. Anyway, that's only the beginning. As for Tamerlan's book, Trolley Ruling in the title refers to a process that is described in the book. Quote, 
Mitchell has conveyed a desire to create an urban legend, which he calls trolley ruling a selected victim into mass murder. It basically involves harassing a person beyond the breaking point using social media to implement psychological terrorism. Trolley Rule is also the name of a character that appears in the book, and more importantly, the name of a YouTuber whose account has since been suspended. The person behind that account was none other than Daniel Marion Mitchell. Daniel had claimed that his book, The Lords of 2112, had inspired various murderers, including Jared Lee Loughner and Luca Magnotta. At one point, he used the trolley rule persona to pretend to be Luca Magnotta, even uploading apparent snuff videos online, and this actually led to him being raided by Michigan State Police and investigated on suspicion of murder. After police realised he was just a troll, he uploaded a confession video on YouTube, in which he admitted that he had been trolling the whole time to promote his book, and he showed some of his personal items that had been seized during the investigation, some of which were still sealed in evidence bags. In December 2012, reports in the form of forum comments claimed that Daniel had taken his own life. Of course, this was yet another hoax, but some people who had been investigating the links between the Lords of 2112 and the book allegedly written by Tamerlan were fooled by this. Some who found connections between Daniel and Two Is Too Young To Die believed that he had faked his own death, but limited records that still exist of these investigations suggest that although they suspected that there were ties between Daniel and the Trolley Rule account, they hadn't found the proof that Daniel definitely was Trolley Rule. They also seemingly missed that shortly after Daniel's alleged death, which occurred two days before the Sandy Hook shooting, he uploaded a video on the Trolley Rule account claiming to be Adam Lanza, which apparently caused him to be investigated by police for a second time. Now at this point, it seems pretty obvious to me for many reasons that the book that was allegedly written by Tamerlan was in fact written by Daniel. It's in line with his sick shenanigans of pretending to be murderers and could absolutely be seen as another futile attempt to promote the Lords of 2112. Daniel was nowhere near relevant or influential enough to be featured in the book if he didn't write it himself, and if the book really was written by Tamerlan, surely it would have gained significantly more attention, yet there are few mentions of it at all online. According to some ex-Masterchan users, Trolley Rule was an active member of the site, and taking into consideration his track record of impersonating murderers and writing grisly books featuring themes related to SA, is not that much of a stretch to suggest that Daniel is J.B. Smeare, the author of Two Is Too Young To Die. This is by far the most plausible theory that exists, in my opinion, but of course there is no solid evidence to prove it. To my knowledge, Daniel never admitted to writing this book, as he admitted many of the other hoaxes he carried out, and there are no direct references to Daniel or the Lords of 2112 in Two Is Too Young To Die, unlike in the book that he claimed was written by Tamerlan, so what could have been his motive? The obvious answer would be that he just gets a kick out of trolling the internet, which is clearly true, but all of his trolling we covered so far was done with the purpose of promoting the Lords of 2112, he admitted that himself in his confession video. Two Is Too Young To Die was apparently being sold on Barnes & Noble for $2, so although I doubt many people actually bought it, it's entirely possible that financial gain was a motive. I do wonder if this was all one big ARG. The book spoke of a game and implied that there was a code to be deciphered, supposedly to save the two-year-old girl's life, which was clearly a fabricated story. I honestly can't tell you if there was a code to decipher in Two Is Too Young To Die. That's certainly not my area of expertise, so while I didn't notice anything in the book myself, I could probably read through it all five times and still miss it. But maybe the real aim of the game was to get people to try and figure out who the real author was. Even if the story in the book was true, determine who the author is and you can probably save the kid, whether or not you solve the code. 
Daniel would have known that people would try to identify him, and sooner or later that would lead them back to the Lords of 2112. He didn't necessarily have to reference his first book in this one to use it as a publicity stunt. That'd be too obvious. He already tried that and it didn't get him anywhere, and the potential hype around an unsolved internet mystery had the capability of resulting in more sales than his previous methods. Even those who didn't quite make all the links to determine that Daniel is Trolley Rule and that he impersonated Tamerlan to write another book still suspected that the Lords of 2112 was somehow relevant, so if this was his goal, it worked to some extent, even if it didn't end up generating many more sales. It's also worth noting that Two is Too Young to Die and the book claimed to be written by Tamerlan can both be read online for free, but these were uploaded by other people and I wasn't able to find a copy of The Lords of 2112 that didn't have to be purchased. Considering every hoax and act of trolling that Daniel did prior to this were all linked to The Lords of 2112, he seemingly viewed this book as his magnum opus. So while this theory lacks any solid evidence, it makes sense and certainly wouldn't be out of character for Daniel. Let's not forget how perverse this book was though. Sure, Daniel had impersonated murders before, some of whom had killed children. He'd written about murder and essay in great detail in his other books, but even for him, describing the essay of children and announcing his plans to create the greatest CP film of all time was taking things to a whole new level, and perhaps that's why he never actually admitted to writing it or planted any solid links that would tie him to the book. He could drop a few breadcrumbs that would leave people wondering without actually incriminating himself. But all this begs the question, was the book a work of total fiction by someone who just got a kick out of trolling and was also really desperate for his other book to finally get the attention he thought it deserved, or is this man actually a paedophile? As I said earlier, I just can't fathom how someone could write about such vile things in such great detail if they're as repulsed by the topic as much as any normal person who isn't a paedophile would be. Maybe I'm being naive here and underestimating the lengths trolls will go to, but considering the 222 community seemingly centred around CP, I think we can be fairly sure that the vast majority of its members were in fact paedophiles. We don't know for a fact that Daniel posted any CP himself using his Trolley Rule account, but he was an active member there, so it certainly wouldn't be surprising. And what business would he have lurking in such communities if he had no interest in that kind of content? To be clear, this is pure speculation, not an accusation. M-Chan is long gone, and all we're left with is a couple of articles, a few old comments scattered about online from around the time, and vague memories that people still have of the site to figure out what on earth was going on. There are no archives, no official news reports, and no concrete proof to accuse any specific individual of any criminal activity, so while I think I've made my opinion of what happened pretty clear, don't take it as fact. Do your own research, come to your own conclusion, and if you find any further information about any of this, please let me know in the comments. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts and theories in the comments, plus any other internet mysteries you'd like me to cover in the future. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing. Huge thank you to my Kofi members and channel members whose names are on screen now, I really appreciate your support. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week for a new video.